Open worlds often pride themselves on being big, but that doesn't really accurately describe exactly why something being big is good. And over the years, developers have had to create techniques that allow them to do more with less, seeing as doing a fully sculpted open world where every single asset, every nook, every cranny is all its own project. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, we're going to ask the question, how are massive game worlds created in open world games? So, to understand how open worlds are created, we have to understand exactly what would go into creating a fully handcrafted open world. And we should be very clear that this is how a lot of open worlds have been created, especially going back a few years. Now, a lot of older open worlds are fully handcrafted, created from the ground up by artists rendering the ground, rendering what's on the ground, rendering whatever is moving around in the area, etc., etc. And this is a tremendous amount of work. When you think about exactly how much detail there is in an open world to create literally the earth itself underneath it, forget whatever's in it, but literally to create the landscape is a lot of work. It should be noted that this is also the route that Cyberpunk 2077's developer CD Projekt Red have taken, and there is definitely a value in doing it, especially with a project that intends to be so vertical in the way that it lays out its open world. 10, 12 years ago, if you played an open world game, a lot of what you were playing was most likely handcrafted, but as the past decade has gone by, a lot of tools have been developed to expedite the process of things that are not necessarily automatically artistic. For instance, specifically, the ground. The ground is a big step that you're more or less basically trying to make something that looks random, because that's ultimately what the Earth is. It's a random product of various forces clashing against each other, and an artist working on that from the ground up is ultimately, of course, trying to simulate that artistically. Ultimately, this is less realistic. Artist renderings are automatically affected by the perspective of the artist, what they've seen, what they've observed, what they consider to be pretty or ugly or whatever thing they're going for. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a fantastic game with what I would argue is an even better open world, and Ubisoft Quebec's Benjamin Hall and Thierry Danisiro did a presentation of exactly how they created this open world and ultimately broke it down to six parts. Knowledge gathering, team engagement slash empowerment, world phases, substance design, sprint review, and having fun. Now, of course, having fun is kind of a necessary aspect of any artistic venture, otherwise, for whatever reason, it seems like it comes out stale. And it should also be fairly self-explanatory what they mean by that. You'll find that this process is quite a bit exactly what we're talking about. Knowledge gathering involves traveling to the actual region of Greece and taking lots of photos of ruins and artifacts that are in museums and seeing everything they could see and bringing all that data, cataloging it, and in a lot of cases, putting it together to engage and empower the team. Along the line, they decided to compare what they saw with what they had seen in films of Greece, and as it turns out, these were slightly conflicting accounts. Greece is portrayed a very specific way in film, and people know that portrayal, but what they had seen contradicted it quite a bit. The team was, of course, empowered to contradict that because they had so much material. Material that showed Greece could be a lot of different things. Of course, as our most large-scale tasks, it was broken into phases. As stated, reviewed every two weeks, not only did it have to be faithfully represented, but also abbreviated in some respects, and some degree of what ancient ruins would look like if they were, well, not ancient ruins, but rather sprawling towns and cities, had to be decided based on tons of photographs, data, and experience that a lot of research was able to yield. This isn't unlike how Ubisoft also made the Far Cry 5 world, except they actually went much deeper into procedural tools for this. Of course, it matches a lot of research and photography, but to make nature, there's just nature to go observe, there's not a lot of culture to take in. Still, this pipeline creates some very convincing places. Similarly, the creators of the Unreal Engine showed off how they created a very vast but populated with animals and fauna and various aspects of nature in a respect where it was beautiful, amazing, sprawling, and 
felt dense in a way a lot of open worlds don't. I'm looking at you, Dynasty Warriors. Which was done by photographing just an absolutely massive number of real things from multiple angles and running it through machine learning. But not just machine learning, there's also an artistic process of sort of delighting, taking the light off of rocks, for instance trying to make it the most pure version of the texture that can be hit by lighting simulation or weather simulation and act like you would expect it to. All of this data was then procedurally placed and it created an amazing big open world that you could probably build just about anything on top of and believe it, at least as much as you need to for a game. In some respects, I would even call it a more naturalistic, realistic, random nature simulation rather than an artistic representation. Certainly how these algorithms and tools are created does imprint some bit of artistic perspective into it, even if unintentionally. But it's not just procedural creation that developers can use in order to create open worlds that are quite big and sprawling and interesting. For instance, Sucker Punch, in creating Infamous, created their own hexagonal grid placement system in which they created tiles hexagonal sections of an open world, and then use the tiles to piece together an open world. This is actually a fairly brilliant way of doing it. It allows you the same kind of artistic control you would want, as well as the ability to simply lay out a world as according to the set pieces you've created. Then when it's all done, you can go in and make little adjustments to avoid it seeming repetitive in case it does. And I'll go ahead and say this, that map does not feel like it's some sort of grid puzzle that some artists put together. It's a good map. Horizon Zero Dawn is a phenomenal example of creating a very dense, big feeling open world that maybe isn't as sprawling as some of the ones we've mentioned here, but however uses some very good procedural tools where the artists can literally just paint a world exactly as they believe it to be. Here's forest, here's rocks, here's water. And the tool sets developed for the game just put that stuff together in a manner that is maybe a little looser than the hexagonal grid system we mentioned with Infamous, but also a little bit quicker to put together than, say, fully hand-building an open world yourself. It's not really procedural content, it's procedural asset placement with the ability to paint zones in which certain assets are more likely to appear. Again, water, trees, etc. Now we've talked a lot about open worlds in various videos through the years, about what makes them good, what makes them bad, and especially given the fact that there are so many of these types of discussions going on everywhere all the time, probably one of the more important questions to ask is, is this method, or rather set of methods, fixing the problem of an open world that feels lifeless, bland, and more or less useless? And I'm going to go ahead and say I kind of think yes. I think that starting off with a sort of randomized template or having minimal input on the actual ground itself and to maybe even some extent simulating nature development, it frees up artists to focus on things that they want in the world as opposed to dedicating a large amount of time to just making ground. Now that's not to say there isn't some level of customization, of course. A lot of games heavily modify the procedural content generated, it just provides a base, and it really doesn't have much of an impact over whether or not the team manages to make an immersive and beautiful world. It just frees up a large element of the process. It is entirely possible to start from the base of a fully procedural world and work in your own personality and artistic preferences, just as it is possible to create something from hand that is bland and uninteresting. I don't know what method they used to create the Dynasty Warriors 9 open world, but whatever it was, they did a bad job. That is the kind of open world we don't want to see nowadays, and to be fair, we're seeing less and less of it. The problems we're seeing more of in open world games revolve less around a bland and empty open world and more around repetitive tasks that the player has to complete, which is kind of both a blessing and a curse in that obviously it's a preferable problem to a world that is bland and uninteresting, but it sure is a problem, isn't it? In any case, research-driven and procedural content generation-driven world-building are two things that have become much more prominent 
and much more useful in terms of creating an actually good end result. And honestly, aside from the problem I mentioned that has nothing to do with the actual creation of the world, I'm pretty damn excited to see the next generation of open worlds. What do you think? Leave us a comment, let us know, and if you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe, and don't forget to click the notification bell. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.